I am a huge fan of Dr. Mastro. Did I say that correctly? Your last name? Yeah. Okay. Huge fan. Um, we met a couple years ago and she came into Chicago randomly. She's a good Chicagoan. Well, and like many people, she and her family have left Chicago. Um, and I, given her, she did two things that blew me, not blew me away, but have stayed with me for a long time. One is she describes China as a capitalist system ruled by a dictator. And number, did I say that right in related to your book? Okay, see, I do remember these things. And number two, she's in the military. She has security clearance. She reads his speeches for fun. She's fluent in Mandarin. And so when it comes to anything China, I always defer to her and her wisdom um, because this is what she does every single day. She pays attention. She reads the speeches. She looks at the word choice and she, she gets them in a way because she's been there. She lives there uh, or she lived there. She gets it. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to you. Go. All things China, Ukraine, supply chain, go. Well, thank you for having me. It was nice the last time I got to do this. Well, I guess it wasn't in person. The first time I did this and was in Chicago, because I am, if you can't tell from the accent, from Chicago, born and bred, raised there. Um, and the second time was from uh, my hideout in Australia, where I was hiding during COVID. So we're doing sort of an around the world tour um, with me and this group out uh, with AEI. Now I'm calling to you from Stanford, California. And what I thought I would do today is focus my initial comments on China and Ukraine. And in particular, you know, what China is learning from the situation in Ukraine, and then what we can learn when we're thinking about China from the situation in Ukraine. So first I wanna say, you know, this is gonna be of a bit of a Debbie Downer talk. And so I apologize for that ahead of time. But things in general that just, you know, aren't great in the world right now, um, and aren't great obviously for Ukraine, aren't great when it's coming to US competition with China more broadly. So. If we're looking at the situation in Ukraine, the conventional wisdom that you've probably heard a lot is, you know, a few things. One, oh man, like China is probably looking at this situation and they are thinking, oh, this is so bad. Um, the reputation is ruined because they have sort of thrown their hat in with the Russians. They're looking at how the Russians are struggling and they're thinking, ah, oh, maybe our plans to take Taiwan should be put on hold because of how difficult this looks. And the international community has come together with such force against Russia uh, in a way that no one predicted after Putin used force that, you know, maybe we, the Chinese, should rethink our own considerations of whether we would use force um, across the Taiwan Strait. And I wish all of that were true, but unfortunately, that is not how China sees this situation. So there's sort of three main points I wanna make. The first is a general point that I don't think what is happening in Ukraine really changes China's strategic thinking about Taiwan at all. And that's not because they're not looking at it and they're not evaluating it, but because what is happening really only seems to support what their previous perceptions were already of US resolve, US capabilities, none of that has changed. And so that, and my, just to give you um, a sense, my previous argument I've written extensively about China's thinking about Taiwan is that they are seriously considering the use of force in the next probably six years uh, to take Taiwan by force. And so when I say that their considerations haven't changed, what I mean is I think they're still along that timeline. Uh, they're, they're, they haven't delayed their thinking about taking of Taiwan because of Ukraine. The second thing I just sort of want to point out more generally is how, uh, I don't want to say it's lazy analysis because that seems a little judgmental, but there's always a lot of shortcuts that people take to understanding China in which they just base their understanding on the fact that China is an autocratic regime. And so the second point I'm going to make in this talk is that not all autocracies are created equal. And in particular, there's nothing about the Russian military that tells us anything about the Chinese military, besides the fact that the Chinese military is vastly superior to the Russian military. So I'm gonna talk about um, that briefly as well and focus uh, as well as uh, on this idea that, you know, yes, of course, China might learn something that, but that learning is only, you know, how to better 
protect itself against these types of activities and that China is in a much better position to protect itself than Russia is, not only militarily, but also economically. And some of my comments I'll be making on the economic side, I'm borrowing from one of my AEI colleagues, Derek Scissors, uh, with whom which uh, I have now engaged in some writing on this topic, uh, forthcoming, looking at sort of the political and economic dimensions of competition. So when we come to Q&A, if you ask me any specific questions about the finance stuff, I'll have to say, you know what, you guys, you should have Derek come and talk to you so he can give you his viewpoints. Uh, my area of expertise is really on the um, military side. So the first thing is to look at, you know, what is China learning about this? Some people are like, okay, this is going to encourage China. Um, you know, maybe Xi Jinping looks at this and sees weaknesses in the West and says, oh, we can take advantage because the United States didn't respond really militarily to what's happened in Ukraine. And certainly Xi Jinping is watching what's happening in Ukraine. But for the most part, his calculus about whether or not to use force against Taiwan is at this point shamed by domestic factors, not really foreign factors. Um, Xi Jinping has now thinks that he has the military capability to take Taiwan by force. The timing of that largely depends on his own desire to um, get a third term consolidated in the next party Congress before he does anything, and then be confident, have a high degree of confidence in that amphibious invasion, which requires honing of certain capabilities, which I'll get to in the next section. So of course, if there's a major shift in the international environment that would be important for Taiwan, this could change Xi Jinping's thinking, but this hasn't really happened yet. So the first component is, you know, this idea that, wow, maybe Xi Jinping should really consider how the world all came together and really punished Russia, and they should think after they took Taiwan by force, a similar thing would happen to them. The economic, the economic sanctions that the United States, Canada, and many European countries have imposed on Russia probably give China little reason for pause for a few reasons. First, uh, Chinese leaders expect there to be some economic costs to an invasion. They accept them to be heavy, but acceptable. In particular, probably three to five years of economic sanctions, they feel like they could weather and they feel like that would be an acceptable cost to get the benefit of taking Taiwan by force. And they think that the level of economic costs would be acceptable partially because of how the international community has responded to Chinese provocations in the past, and partly because Xi Jinping's China has a foreign policy that's particularly designed to convince countries to stay out of China's internal affairs and to convince countries that they should put the economic ties with China before political issues like that of Taiwan. So this isn't to say that you know, the economic measures that we've imposed on Russia aren't significant. We've blocked Russia's access to most of its foreign currency reserves. We've made it impossible for Moscow to intervene to prop up its collapsing currency. Um, we've you know, frozen assets of senior Russian officials, excluded big banks from SWIFT, et cetera, et cetera. But even though Russia has basically very minimal, probably existent, but minimal ability to hurt the United States economically, we could do much more to punish Russia. Right, but we didn't go all the way with the economic sanctions. We haven't barred all transactions with Russia, whether they be trade or financial. We haven't seized Russian assets, you know, within our jurisdictions, those of the United States, our allies and our partners. We could announce secondary sanctions against anyone using US dollars for transactions with Russia. Um, we could prevent, use a lot more measures to prevent Russia from exporting oil and gas. But we haven't taken it to that level, level of punishment that in parallel might be enough to convince China not to use force. And we've been so cautious, even though China's ability to retaliate against the West with their economic sanctions of their own is so much greater than that of Russia. So just one example, Singapore, which announced uh, trade and, and banking restrictions against Moscow in the aftermath of the invasion, invasion trades about $2.5 billion worth of goods with Russia a year, but trades $57 billion worth of goods from China. The idea that because countries were willing to come together against Russia, that they would be willing to do the same against China, especially our Asian allies and partners, for which China is our number one trading partner, is probably not the case. They probably, you know, think that the cost to them would be too high. And so Chinese leaders not only think the sanctions are not going to be so severe, but they also are more resistant to those types of sanctions. They have their own productive capacity, their own resources, and their own friendly partners that let them survive a bit longer on their own than the Russians would. They would be able to absorb the type of sanctions against Russia to a much better degree. 
the other thing that comes up is like, you know, what does this say about resolve of the United States? And the United States messaging on this has been very clear that Taiwan is not Ukraine. And this messaging is very important because we're not, we're doing, I don't want to say we're doing little, but our military assistance to Ukraine has been modest, right? We've released uh, weapons uh, and, you know, considering more military assistance, but it's not like the United States ever considered actually directly entering the conflict to defend Ukraine, of which I, I, I'm supportive of, the, of that decision. But we've been very clear that while the United States was not going to directly intervene in the case of Ukraine, even as this crisis was escalating, the Biden administration made a stark contrast with their rhetoric on Taiwan. They stated unequivocally after the Russian invasion that the United States would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese attack. Biden also sent a delegation to Taiwan of former U.S. officials led by Mike Mullen, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, to signal, okay, just be, you know, don't get any ideas that because we're not militarily, directly militarily involved in Ukraine, we wouldn't be militarily involved in Taiwan. So, you know, this doesn't prevent China from manipulating the narrative. Uh, they are, you know, Chinese state media is flush with stories about how the United States didn't come to Ukraine's aid. So that means we won't come to Taiwan's aid either. I sort of dismiss this as largely uh, attempts at psychological warfare against Taiwan is not an uh, indication of what the Chinese believe um, themselves. So in general, this is, you know, not the right time. And ironically, if the United States had committed uh, more militarily, to the war in Ukraine, that might have changed China's calculus because it might have made them think, huh, the United States is more distracted. Maybe now is a better time uh, to launch our attack on Taiwan. But because we haven't done that and we still, at least for the short term, remain focused on rebuilding our deterrence in Asia, um, I don't think China is either given pause or encouraged one way or another. So Chinese leaders, I think, are without a doubt considering the, this attack on Taiwan. But now is not a good time especially because of what's happened with Ukraine. The Chinese military is still honing their capabilities. Um, Xi Jinping is not going to take this risk on Taiwan before the next party Congress in late 2022. Um, and in general, there are some benefits to waiting, which I'll get to in a second, about uh, China's attempts to improve in some areas where Russia has been weak. Uh, China also doesn't want the world to the two scenarios of Ukraine um, and uh, Taiwan, because from China's perspective, Taiwan is an inalienable part of China's territory, while their position on Ukraine, they have views that seem more supportive of Russia, like that Russia has security concerns when it comes to the expansion of NATO. There's a lot of these narratives, but they don't believe that you know, Russia has the same legitimate claim to Ukraine as they have over Taiwan. And they also understand that if they moved against Taiwan at the same time that this is happening with Ukraine, this would solidify fears in the West of an axis of autocrats. The number one way that China could win a fight over Taiwan is if countries mainly don't want to get involved, and if the United States doesn't have the resolve to really fight a protracted war to defend Taiwan. If, they're sudden, if we're all suddenly faced with this prospect that this isn't about Taiwan, but it's about defending freedom and democracy against this authoritarian alliance between Russia and China, then probably we'd be able to muster a greater military response and convince our allies, not only in Asia, but also in Europe, to do the same. So because of that, China hasn't been great at maintaining this sort of semblance of neutrality. Our view in the West is they've thrown in their hat with Russia, but they have you know, tried to be very clear they're not, you know, going to provide Russia with troops or equipment or, or their things like that, that they're not all in on the Russian side, basically to avoid this eventuality. So another thing that people sort of bring up is they're like, okay, so maybe, you know, this, what's happened in Ukraine doesn't change their calculus as much when it comes to U.S. capabilities and resolve. But what about their own capabilities? The bottom line is, you know, the Russian military performed much more poorly than we had expected it to, right? Everyone overestimated Russian capabilities, probably including Putin himself. During the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, their air to ground coordination has been relatively ineffective. Um, the Russian forces have shown risk aversion uh, to conducting operations. They have struggled with logistics. They've struggled to keep their military supplied. Uh, most notably, they've maxed out firepower. Um, they seem to have a very limited amount of precision guided munitions. And it's also been seen as uh, one of the main weaknesses that uh, orders have been unable to make it down to lower levels and that there's some command and control issues. 
Now, a lot of people think, well, you know, these are both autocratic regimes. Maybe the Chinese military would um, have the same issues and exhibit the same deficiencies. And indeed, they did um, about 10 years ago. But since then, the Chinese military has embraced significant reforms to try to improve in exactly these areas where the Russians have been struggling. And the result is a much more capable fighting force. So first, while Russia had largely allowed their conventional capabilities to atrophy, Chinese military spending has exploded over the past three decades. It's increased by 740% compared to Russia's 69% from 1992 to about 2017. So if you look at you know, China's military modernization in 1999, Less than 2% of their fighters were modern, 4% of their attack submarines, and none of their surface ships. 20 years later, not only does China have much more of anything, everything, but the majority of it is advanced and modern, uh, with China exhibiting significant advantages over Russia, including in combat aircraft, which is an area of traditional weakness for China. So Chinese commentators, military commentators, they also often refer to China's economic might is one of the reasons their military outperforms that of Russia. So one of the weaknesses I laid out in Ukraine is that they've run out of munitions. But China wouldn't be as stingy as the sort of Chinese uh, writings have said with their military modernization, and that they have focused on a great production of precision guided munitions. Um, and by contrast, you know, I think the Russians had about a thousand munitions total. Um, China has over 2,200 conventionally armed ballistic and cruise missiles. Their strategic rocket force is the largest ground-based missile force in the world. Indeed, just across the Taiwan Strait, there's about a thousand short-range ballistic missiles just across Taiwan. So, you know, what Russians' poor performance does is it reminds us that it does take a lot more than fancy systems to win a war, right? They also have some fancy stuff. Of course, for China, having more advanced systems, having more of them surely helps. But what Ukraine probably tells everyone, uh, if we forgot, is that there's a Russian element. And the Russian element, uh, sorry, a human element. And the human element to Russia's failures is front and center. Putin probably didn't have an open and honest command chain with his military, which was fearful of providing him some unfavorable information. Russian troops uh, have proved themselves to be largely incompetent, uh, but Putin thought that superior technology could overcome some of these human deficiencies. Now, Xi Jinping, when he came into power 10 years ago, he identified similar training and competency issues within the PLA. Uh, but under his command, he has implemented significant reforms. So unlike Putin, who believes that technology could overcome deficiencies, Xi Jinping came to the opposite conclusion. He took one look at his military and he recognized that with all their fancy equipment, they probably couldn't fight or win wars. They probably couldn't perform the missions that had been assigned to them. Uh, and so what followed in China was a series of slogans, because I always love slogans like the two incompatibles, the two enables, the five incapables. You know, all of these slogans are designed to point out that there were serious personnel and organizational issues of the military. They decided they had to refocus leadership attention and resources on fixing the issue. What came after was a massive military reorganization that involved, it's basically like taking the Pentagon and saying the Pentagon no longer exists, we're gonna do something completely different. And the main reason they did this was to ensure that they could mobilize more quickly, that smaller units at the lower levels could remain self-sufficient for longer periods of time. They also established these theater commands to facilitate joint operations. They also knew they had to conduct more realistic exercises. And indeed, the type of exercises we've observed, China conducting air operations that combine strike and fighters and lift and intel surveillance and reconnaissance are of a complexity that we haven't seen Russia do. So the fact that they've struggled with these combined arms, you know, maybe we were surprised of it, but China has demonstrated the ability to do this at a much uh, greater, uh, on a much greater scale. And part of this, you know, is that Xi Jinping very openly demanded that the military communicate its failures and weaknesses to him. The realistic exercises were designed as opportunities for promotion for the military if they brought to him the issues they were facing. And so it's unlikely that in the scenario like they have with Putin, that the military in China feels like it cannot tell Xi what the problems are and what they need um, because there is this more positive feedback loop associated with it. So there's a great deal of, you know, if we look at their service level operations and what they're trying to do on the joint level, we can see that the Chinese have moved to be able to engage in joint operations. They've set up a new joint uh, operations command center to ensure that unlike Russia, 
their orders could be communicated and understood at the lowest levels. Now, this isn't to say that you know, all issues are resolved. Indeed, one of the main reasons I argue that Xi Jinping has not made a play for Taiwan yet is his desire to hold the command and control and engage in more realistic exercises to practice the joint operations that would be so complex and that the Russians have struggled with so much in Ukraine. So I'm not saying that we should expect, you know, the Chinese military to, to have avoided all pitfalls, but I don't think we should expect them to perform poorly as well. The, the People's Liberation Army is structurally superior to the Russian military, and the Chinese know it. Um, it's hard to tell whether it's more hubris or outlandish claims, but one of my favorite pastimes right now is to read Chinese military assessments of the Russian campaign, um, in which like a PLA Air Force officer has written, you know, they'd be able to take out the Ukrainian Air Force in one hour. Um, they say absolutely they have more PGM stockpiled than they would have stockpiled more precision guided munitions, excuse me, if they were going to go attack the Ukraine on that level and ensure solid command and control. And more importantly, it's interesting that you know, we're getting actually all this information coming out of Ukraine as Chinese strategists write that they would have cut off internet access to prevent the leaking of information to the West, um, you know, immediately. So on the military side, they knew what those weaknesses are and they fixed them. On the economic side, while I can't talk to it in, in, in as great of detail, like I said, you've got to invite Derek out here to do so. They also identified a lot of these vulnerabilities in their economy and they've specifically diversified in a way to try to make it so they could better withstand pressure. Right. Beijing is very integrated into the global economy. So in some ways they could be, you know, hurt um, by certain sanctions. But on the other hand, they have a lot more capital resources. Right. And Beijing has been able to mobilize greater capital resources than than Moscow. Like in 2020, the World Bank put China's gross fixed capital formation at 20 times that of Russia's. Um, and if you look at you know, Beijing uh, and their currencies, they've also, you know, they have greater reserves and a greater ability to project their currency in the face of financial sanctions as well. Do you look at what type of restrictions, you know, the United States might or might not put on China, just looking at the SWIFT uh, restrictions that interfere with outbound U.S. portfolio investment. You know, this is uh, putting uh, sanctions on $85 billion of U.S. outbound invest, uh, portfolio investment with Russia, but we have $1.15 trillion of such investment with China. So, yeah, I mean, the stock of U.S. Uh, direct investment is 10 times higher in China than it is in Russia. So companies are willing to exit Russia, you know, maybe given what's happened in Ukraine, are they just as happy to exit China? Uh, probably not. I just had a conversation with a CEO of a company that leases uh, aircraft to China, and this whole Russia thing has gotten them very worried because, of course, they have now lost aircraft in Russia because the sanctions gave them, a, what, up to 30 days to be able to get their aircraft out, but they can't get their aircraft um, out, so they basically lost it. But they, you know, a huge amount of their fleet, you know, like 80% is being leased out by China. So if something happened to that degree, it would basically mean the end of business. And so it, it's not only on the, you know, export and trade side, but in general, um, China has also tried to really secure its supply chains, um, extending from, you know, inputs that are crucial, like, you know, global pharmaceuticals, processed rare earths, um, but they have the Made in China 2025. In general, they've been trying to have a lower import dependency and lower dependency on the West for technology as well. So, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has been learning from the Russian Soviet experience for decades, but mainly what they've been learning is what not to do. Right. First, they learn what not to do if you want to you know, maintain your communist regime uh, at the end of the Cold War. And now it's kind of like what not to do if you want to be a great power and not lose your great power status. Chinese strategists undoubtedly are evaluate, evaluating things like as the nature of warfare changed, are there certain factors that they weren't considering that are now necessary for success? Chinese economists are probably looking to see if they missed any vulnerabilities, looking at how the economic dimensions of this war has played out. But what that means is this, uh, the, uh, the, 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 an unfortunate side effect of this war in Ukraine is that China has a relatively low cost opportunity to learn. And what it means is it's probably going to be a more formidable challenger in the future than it would have been otherwise once it, you know, learning from this experience helps it identify any remaining weaknesses, whether they be military or economic. So I think I'll stop there and leave plenty of time for questions. All right, we've had three questions texted in. 
if anybody um, has a question, just raise your hand, put it in the chat. Um, we have a small group. And um, the three questions that were texted in uh, range. One is, uh, can you speak to the ballistic missile that went around the world? Mm -hmm. And how do we prepare? Two, um, your, uh, um, if you were president, what would you do to make, make sure we're ready? And how, given all of the strengths and, and that you laid out that China has, how do we respond to Taiwan? And are we ready to respond based on your wisdom? Um, and number three, what do you think their end game is? And that's it. Okay. Oh, th oh that's it. Okay. Okay. So yeah, well, those were the three questions texted. Just, just like everything China wants, what we should do to resolve the world's issues. And do we have to worry about nuclear annihilation? Okay. So I'll yeah, start no with, pressure. I'll start with the hypersonic test. So China conducted this test. It was, um, a, a hypersonic, uh, you know, it was a boost glide vehicle, a missile went around the world um, and then reached, I think within 24, it was 24 miles of an intended target. This was very concerning to the United States for a number of reasons. First, it suggests that China has a much greater ability than we thought to engage in a, in a surprise nuclear attack against the United States. The thing with hypersonics, um, are they're very difficult to defend against. And they're difficult to defend against largely because of their maneuverability and basically that their re-entry, unlike a ballistic missile trajectory in which we have a, we see the ballistic missile for like a long period of time because its trajectory is you know kind of goes up and then comes back down. When you have hypersonics, when they're glide vehicles, that they actually are skimming closer to the Earth's surface for a period of time, which makes them harder for radars to pick up track and um, you know detect. And so the maneuverability of hypersonics is a real problem. As a side note, I mean this we were concerned in the nuclear realm, but as a side note, uh, China's advancements in hypersonics, of which they've done you know, 10 times more testing in this area than the United States concerns us as well because uh, it might give China a conventional strike capability against the United States. So right now, China does not have the ability to hit the continental United States or even Hawaii actually, but the continental United States with conventional weapons. They can basically affect our space systems. They can attack us through cyber and then they have a nuclear capability. But hypersonics uh, opens up the doorway in terms of longer range of systems as well. And so that creates a lot of concern. So it's mainly about, I think there was a panic about emerging technologies more generally and how China is much more advanced in terms of test, you know, patents, research, development, testing in certain critical areas, hypersonics being one, but also quantum computing, AI and incorporating AI into their military processes. All of these sort of gives the United States this, this sense of anxiety that we're behind. Uh, so I think that was one issue with the test. The second one was, again, it, it shows that China has maybe a greater ability than we thought to launch a surprise nuclear attack against um, the United States. And then in general, just their advancements in hypersonics might mean a greater conventional capability against the US in the future. Before I get to kind of what we can do about it, I wanna to go to what China's end game is. Um, and I wanna say that I kind of have a cop-out answer for this, but I think it's important to think about it this way. China wants to build power, as much power as it can, so it can do whatever it wants, whenever it decides what it wants to do. So what does that, what does that mean? What that means is, you know, we have this idea that like, that China has, China does have some goals right now, like short-term goals, like we know, like they want to take Taiwan by force, but they haven't, you know, planned out this sort of vision of like on a hundred year marathon or that people sort of say that like China has planned out, you know, world domination. That's not really the case. In a lot of cases, especially when it comes to China's Re, their role outside of the region. There's a lot of debate in China about, you know, do they want global leadership? Do they not want global leadership? Do they want to be, you know, like they started doing a little conflict mediation. That seems like a big headache. Like, why do we want to be involved in all these conflicts all over the globe? So there's a lot of back and forth about this. So I think their approach is really like, you know, the Deng Xiaoping approach of crossing the river by feeling for rocks. Like they want what some authoritative publications call strategic space which is basically the space to make, when, when the time comes and they're faced with a decision, you wanna go this way, you wanna go that way. 
that they, they don't have to think about restrictions of their capabilities and the potential of other countries to stop them when they're making decisions about what's best for them. They don't want to be deterred. And so I think, you know, that's ultimately what China wants. Right now, you know, I also think from a strategic standpoint, What's important to note is what we do know, 100%, what we do know they want, things like taking Taiwan by force, things like controlling the South China Sea, things like pushing the United States military out of the region. I think, I believe China's sort of territorial expansion ends there. I don't think then they wanna take Japan or they wanna take Australia, but even if it ends there, what we know they want is already too much. It's already, you know, goes against too much what U.S. interests are. So the uncertainty of like, well, what will they want next? I get the anxiety associated with that uncertainty, but from a strategic perspective, what they've already told us they're trying to accomplish like in the next 10 to 15 years is already so bad that we, we need to have a sense of urgency to consolidate our, our efforts to compete with them. So I, I sometimes push back against this not this this logic of like, oh, but if they if we don't, fight in this area, then it'll get worse. Because what I want people to understand is what we already know is, is bad enough. And it is enough for us to bring ourselves together to compete. So what should we do to compete? So I, I think in kind of very granular terms about a lot of this, and there's sort of two main points that I want to make. The first is it's really hard. It's really hard for me to come up with, and I know we do it for op eds and stuff. But in terms of my advising for government, when I get this kind of question, we always want some like grand framework, you know, like the one answer, the one sentence, and then we can easily apply that to like all different areas of how we're competing with China. And if we had to have something like that, I think there's a few contours of it. I mean, the first one is I think U.S.-China competition is not about China. It's not about the United States, it's about the United States relationship with the rest of the world. And if we want to be competitive, we have to be the preferred partner with the rest of the world. We have to be a preferred global leader in the rest of the world. And a lot of that has to do with improvements at home. And so I don't know if any of you had like the opportunity to come out for AEI's like Sea Island retreat or a lot of the other stuff that's happening at AEI that's really about domestic issues, totally outside of my area of expertise. But I will tell you that when I look at this and I was on in a working group about like semiconductor vulnerability recently, it, all, it came down to education and immigration reform. You know, like a lot of what makes the United States competitive is not only imposing costs on China for certain behaviors that we don't like, but ensuring that our own domestic base for comp uh, competition is strong. So if you have to think about something, it's like, just do a better job, everyone. Like have better foreign policies, you know, have better domestic policies in order to compete, you know, but that that is not particularly helpful. Um, uh, and I would also say that one of the areas of competition that's difficult is the United States, we think to compete, we basically work with a handful of countries and we ignore the rest of the world. But the majority of the world are autocracies. A minority of the world are democracies and 80% of the world is the developing world. So part of our competitive, like our strategy with China has been like, okay, okay, okay. They get the developing world and they get the non-democracies, but that's like the whole world. And like, yes, you know, the United States and our allies and partners, we have great economic might and we have strong militaries, but the world doesn't function with globalization in the way that you can ignore 80% of it and still, you know, outcompete your adversary in terms of global competition. So I think we absolutely need better strategies for the developing world, um, of which, as far as I know, we have never really had one and we continue not to have one in terms of, you know, my advising of the Biden administration, on the national security strategy, things of that sort. Now, we can get, I would say the third main component of what I think about competition that makes me so frustrated is that if you told any business person, okay, if I asked, if I asked you, okay, before you set up this company, I want to know the exact plan, like, you know, step by step, this is what you're going to do to ensure that you gain the most market share. And you have to do everything in that plan for the next 30 years, and you can't do anything different. No adjustments, no flexibility. You'd be like, I can't do that. There is very little room in policy, in foreign policy and defense policy for experimentation. And so there might be people much smarter than me that, you know, when the administration comes to me and they're like, okay, Oriana, can you tell us how to get China to uh, give up their nuclear weapons? 
And I'm like, well, I can tell you like step one, two, how to get them into arms control talks. Then I need to see, you know, what got them into the talks. And then I need to see how they act in the talks. And then I need to take that information and update my strategy. And then I can tell you maybe what your negotiation strategy should be. And then maybe I can tell you once I see how they negotiate, like I need that constant inflow of information. I can't tell you how to do the whole thing from the beginning to end, but we don't have any patience for experimentation. Uh, and I think largely it's because of the hostility of our partisan politics that no plan or strategy is going to withstand anything if it looks like, you know, there's failures, but to perfect a plan, you, you need to be able to evaluate the things that are going well and the things aren't, that aren't going well. And that's also why our leadership, not only political leadership, but military leadership is so extremely risk averse. Um, I will tell you that I am the thorn in everybody's side at the Pentagon. And just recently, I mean, I got in so much trouble with some colonels that I actually had to, uh, I was in DC recently, had to go meet with the four star, the head of like the whole air force to be like, I need you, <laughs> I need you to protect me from these because I have no patience for this, but this is how we do things. I have no patience for it, especially when it comes to the competition. What we're trying to do on a larger scale is we have this new threat. We have a new adversary and that's competing with us in a new way. And our response is, let's just do the same stuff we've always done. Let's just do like a little bit more of it. Oh, we'll just do some more arm sales. We'll do some more exercises. And I'm like, that's not gonna cut it. Let's do some different things. And so I'm, you know, if you ask me specifically, how do we compete in this area? Then I have much more granular recommendations for you, all of which are wildly unpopular. You know, and which I'm like, well, there's like, well, but we don't do that. You know, well, have anyone evaluated whether it's a good idea that we don't take positions on the territorial disputes in Southeast Asia? Is it a good idea that exclusive economic zones where China is causing all the trouble with our allies and partners are not included in our treaty obligations? Maybe it is a good idea. But the idea of like, well, that's just not how we usually do things to me is not in any way convincing. Um, and so I'm constantly like, I want. I want to see, I want us to at least, maybe you don't try it, maybe it's too bold to do it strategically, but at least be able to brainstorm stuff um, and understand like, why is this going to be a horrible idea? So at least with the, you know, a lot of the, the problem with the Trump administration where a lot of their policies were bad, but the good thing about it is they, they did try to do different things, right? So if we if we could embrace that mentality of trying things differently, but maybe rely a bit more on expertise about what those different things would be and have an openness in our political system so that we could adjust uh, in, in order to compete, I think we'd do a much better job. So that's a very long answer to that question. On behalf of all Americans, thank you for being a thorn in the Pentagon. Pentagon side because um, I think what you're doing is going to protect us all in the long term. With that, our next question comes from Kevin Callis. Kevin. Thank you. I was just curious. Um, in the news recently, they talked about the unofficial military presence in Taiwan. And I wondered, does that give China pause or is it small enough that it's really not a factor? Yeah. So the, a lot of that is more about um, political signaling. Operationally, it doesn't really have uh, an impact. What the United States and other countries are trying to do is help Taiwan build up its own defenses to push back against occupation. And the first part of that is like convincing Taiwan to actually want to do that, uh, which shouldn't be as hard as it is, but it is apparently really hard. Um, so people are like, oh, great. Well, now with Ukraine, now Taiwan is more interested in learning from other countries. But my own view is that while that's very important, Taiwan is never going to be able to defend itself, ever. Like you look at the balance of forces between China and the United States, they're bad for us. Like for Taiwan, it's impossible. So we have to just be honest. What we're hoping is not that Taiwan can defend itself. What we're hoping is that they can hold off a Chinese invasion long enough to give the United States time to get there. But right now, I think some of the logic in terms of the signaling that I see is we're trying to tell Beijing like, okay, maybe you'll successfully take Taiwan, but like occupation is gonna be hard. And the Chinese just don't really think that's gonna be the case. And I think they're probably right. So for example, I'll just say, and this is a very morbid example and I apologize for it, but there are more Uyghurs in camps than there are men and young men in Taiwan. 
I mean, China, while it hasn't fought a war since 1979, it has been engaging in internal repression for a very long time. It's honed its capabilities. It has a lot of resources to dedicate to something like that. So the idea that once they got to Taiwan, that they would, you know, they would have difficulty repress, you know, repressing that population, I think is a much more mirror imaging of what the United States experiences, you know, war with Afghanistan or, you know, Iraq or something than, than what China's experiences would be. I also, I was just recently at a talk with the commander of, um, you know, special operations in, in the Pacific and, you know, they're very like, you know, oh, maybe we'll do some training with them, this, that, and the other. But I asked this question, I'm like, how many guns are there on the island of Taiwan? It's like, well, like none, it's like Japan, you know, they don't have weapons. And I'm like, that, well, like, okay, okay. So like, what are they, what are these people fighting with when they're rising up against the Chinese? Um, so I also think we have to, there's also this idea, and it, it's so silly. I, this is another silly idea. I don't know where it comes from. That advanced economies like that of Taiwan are harder to repress. Like with the semiconductor industry, people who are knowledgeable, like intellectuals, um, are more likely to like stand up to repression and to not capitulate. I feel like it's obviously a bunch of intellectuals who wrote that uh, because if I were a dictator and I was going to go take over somewhere, like I would much rather take over a place filled with like really weak, smart people than with like people who are used to, you know, building their own fires or going out and working with their hands or something. I mean, I, I don't know where this idea came from. My idea, like China takes over Taiwan, they're going to go to all those scientists that work at TMSC at that semiconductor fab, and they're going to be like, do you want to be a Communist Party member and get some special elite status and get twice your salary to continue working at this, at this factory? And they're going to be like, yeah, fine. Sounds good. I mean, no one's coming to save me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. So I don't. A lot of that is more on the political side that the United States is trying to say, you know, we're trying to be kind of risky to say, you know, if this provokes China, if this escalates to a war, you know, we're willing to fight that war. So it's our attempt to signal our credibility to defend Taiwan, but operationally, it doesn't have a large impact. To read the question, it was just basically about the China Russia relationship. And that Russia has a lot to fear from China, you know, because of the Chinese mig uh, migration, I think, to the Far East um, uh, and the higher resource density uh, with their neighbor. So all of that is true. So I have this larger study. Maybe I'll have to come back and talk about it. I spent two years doing this study and then I put it on hold because I'm trying to finish uh, a book right now. But then this war happens and I'm like, oh, maybe I should go back to the study, but it's about China and Russia's military alignment. And, you know, based on different types of exercises, statements, things like what can we actually devise that they're preparing for in terms of supporting each other in various contingencies. Um, and one of the things that comes up is I know is that the Russians have basically decided and uh, that through confidence building measures with Beijing, and Beijing has been very proactive at building those confidence measures, whether it's along the border, or about China's presence in Central Asia, for example, um, that, uh, that China no longer really presents a significant threat um, to Russia. They've, you know, they have a lot of law enforcement coordination, for example, to help uh, stop some of that migration to the Far East. So the fact that like the Chinese are trying to help the Russians deal with it and manage it. Um, and so the internal like threat perceptions and documents of the Chinese threat have decreased significantly uh, in Russia. So while, you know, before they signed some of their agreements, the treaty of was a good neighborliness um, in 2001. And then they started some of these confidence building measures over the border. Since then, their internal assessments of, you know, the threat of China have changed significantly and have decreased. So I think the Russians have basically decided, you know, that the biggest threat is the United States and that they don't have the wherewithal to really challenge U.S. hegemony in the international system, but China does. Uh, and so they are taking major risks. I mean, it's not only with the border, the Russians have been arming the Chinese and in particular have been helping the Chinese develop some technologies in areas where their military is the weakest. This is shifting the, you know, not even just along the border, but the general balance of power between Russia and China to China's favor. Um, and so what this suggests is not only that the Russians feel like it's worth it um, to counter the United States, but also they believe that this relationship with China is going to be enduring, right? It's not something for just the next handful of years, but something that will last a long enough time to make these risks worth it. John, you want to ask your question? 
<clears throat> Doctor, you mentioned the Uyghurs. Uh, how serious are they being treated and why do you think the world is really just giving it a pass? So I have to say, John, I'm not a human rights expert, so I don't have a lot of insight into this. I mean, I basically looked at the situation more from a great power perspective that I think, you know, China has basically done a very successful job at countering U.S. human rights diplomacy and creating a space for itself such that, you know, countries, organizations, like through their infiltration of the U.N. Human Rights Commission and stuff, can't put significant pressure on China. Um, I think if you look at like some of the statistics, I mean, there's a reason why the United States and other countries have come out and called it genocide. From the Chinese perspective, you know, it just shows how unsophisticated they are about their understanding of the world. I was in a track um, 1.5 in which uh, when this was initially starting up, you know, years ago, actually, right? So this was when my now four-year-old was like just born. And I was in Sweden talking to the Europeans about this. So it must have been like, yeah, like three years ago when they first started putting Uyghurs in camps. And, um, you know, one of the Europeans asked about it and the representative from the Chinese government was like, well, you know, we can't tell who's a terrorist and who isn't. So we just have to put everyone in camps. And if you look at the full Chinese population, having a couple million people in camps is like not that big of a deal. And everyone was like, what are you talking about? Like, so, I mean, they were sort of very blatant and from their perspective, like, you know, the, nothing had really changed in terms of their maltreatment of minorities. So it's like interesting to them that now all of a sudden the whole world is paying attention. Um, but I think in general, Generally speaking, it's probably because the Uyghurs don't have a huge overseas population that is, you know, bringing this issue up and trying to protect them. And and China is very good at telling countries that the economic relationships are more important, and getting you know Muslim countries to sign letters saying that they treat their Muslim populations, you know, brilliantly and, and beautifully. So. That's a big issue with the United States only relying on our allies and partners. I mean, it's a perfect example of which we're like, well, you know, we got a handful of countries to sign a letter condemning them for their behavior, but China came back and got more countries. Um, and also, you know, Muslim countries to sign a letter saying that they were doing just fine. So these are these areas of competition, like beyond the military realm that are also, uh, you know, really important, but we sort of have to ask ourselves on the strategic level, I think we go back and forth of like, you know, how important are the human rights issues to the United States? Like, you know, why, you know, what is the role of human rights diplomacy? And if this is a value above all other values, then even if there are economic costs to doing the right thing, then we have to, you know, push everyone to be willing to accept those costs, um, you know, and be more, it's not even just about the Uyghurs, but about treatment in general. Uh, of, of Chinese citizens that international organizations shouldn't be doing business in certain ways when, when China is violating some of those values. But yeah, I don't have a good answer for you on that one. All right, final question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, when, when you came two years ago or talked to this group two years ago, uh, you said it'd be about four years. What before China invaded Taiwan, do you still stick with that number? So it'd be three years. So it was last year. So I think I said six. So I was thinking it was like a 2026, 2028 timeframe. And I've and I still stick to that. That's where I think the danger zone is. And that's so I just want to clarify that like I don't think Xi Jinping needs Taiwan. You know, the the motivation or the temptation is not like he's going to lose power if he doesn't do it. The temptation is more that he can, you know, if he can do it and he can do it at an acceptable cost, like what a boon to his legacy to be able to say, like, I was the one to end that kind of civil war. So the reason I think, you know, that's the timeline is because in 2020, when some of the major military reforms came to an end and they said, okay, now we have for the first time this amphibious capability online, it was like, you know, brand new. Right. It's like, let's just say you just got your driver's license. So maybe we should kind of test it out a little bit before we do it. And so just looking at sort of their paces and frequencies of exercises, I thought it would probably be about, you know, six years before they had co enough confidence to move. But that's where my assessment comes from. It's not really about 
it's not about like closing gaps. You know, I've heard this argument that like, oh, the, you know, China realizes the United States has resolved all of our issues. And so we're going to be super powerful in like 10 years from now. I'm like, well, I don't know who these Americans are that have resolved these issues, but I still show up to the Pentagon trying to figure out how to protect our bases, try to figure out how to project power against China. And I still haven't figured it out. So I don't think it's that kind of like window of opportunity closing logic or Xi Jinping needs this to stay in power logic. I think it's basically like, They've got the capability now, they just want to play around with it a little bit more. I'm grateful you are doing the work that you do on behalf of our country, on behalf of AEI. Um, keep going, keep going, keep going. And you're coming back. Mm -hmm. And whenever you're in the Midwest, Florida, pick the spot. Love to take advantage of your time, even if it's for 30 minutes. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we will send this recording out um, to you just because it was so good and so much great information. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you very much for having me and for your support of AEI. I have to tell you that all the time I go to AEI, I never have any, I love my bosses at AEI. I'm always like, oh, it gives me a great peace of mind and makes me bolder in, in what I do to have the support of AEI and to have your support. So thank you for that. Thank so, you. Bye. Bye.